let's jump in and get started. Uh, this uh, panel is, is really interesting. It's titled Homeroom to Dorm Room to Board Room. Uh, student founders uh, talking about their journeys. Uh, and uh, first of all, I uh, want to kick it off by introducing myself. I am Jody Goldstein. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Innovation Labs. And we started in 2011 to uh, support um, students' innovation and entrepreneurial journey all across Harvard, uh, really focusing on the educational mission and the skills that they can develop in whatever it is they want to do. Um, but I'm really excited today to talk to these four amazing founders who all started uh, ventures while they were in school, um, even in the uh, eight, um, almost eight years that uh, we've been in existence, the landscape has changed so tremendously and the interest in an entrepreneurial career path uh, continues to grow. Um, you know, I was talking to a few panelists before this that um, early on it was you know, such an unconventional career path and now it's becoming more and more acceptable uh, starting a company in school and pursuing that entrepreneurial journey. And um, so it's so exciting to see um, how universities have um, begun to really uh, support that and nurture it in some really profound ways. Um, so today, uh, what I'd really like to talk about is lessons learned from these uh, founders sitting up on stage uh, today. The, the role of a university in supporting and nurturing entrepreneurship, and then possibly diving into a little bit of, of the provocative question of the future of higher ed and, and how, that, um, how the entrepreneurial journey uh, fits in with the continued relevance or irrelevance of higher ed. Um, so before we jump in, I would love to give um, each of the founders an opportunity to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey um, starting in, uh, in school, or um, I think for some of you it was started in high school, not just college, um, and let you introduce yourselves, and then we can jump into the uh, questions. Kendall, do you want to start? Yeah. I'm Kendall Reynolds. I'm 25 years old. I'm from the south side of Chicago. I started my company, Kendall Miles Designs, from my college dorm room at the University of Southern California, um, more or less three years ago now, and uh, I make luxury women's footwear out of Italy. Thanks, Ken. Uh, my name is Darshan. I'm also from Chicago, from the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, when I was in high school, I started a website called EasyBib that helps students format citations uh, for their papers. Um, and that was a side business for <laughs> quite a while. Um, <laughs> before pursuing EasyBib full time, I started another company uh, with a friend of mine that I called Dropio that ended up selling uh, to Facebook. And then after that, uh, Chegg acquired EasyBib. And so I've been running their uh, product team for the writing tools business at Chegg out of New York. Uh, John Katzman, I founded the Princeton Review uh, from college, ran it for many years. Uh, and then I've started a couple companies afterwards but as a old guy. <laughs> a grown up, we like to say. <laughs> uh, my name is Ashu. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Make School. Um, we're building a new university actually in San Francisco. Um, I started building apps when I was in high school. I really fell in love with the idea of computer science as a tool to create products and experiences for people um, and felt a bit stifled uh, with my computer science classes at UCLA. I uh, felt they were very theory-based and not very relevant to the type of things that I wanted to be doing. Um, so I ended up leaving school as, as uh, we ended up starting um, what's now Make School. Back then we were building uh, different apps and kind of teaching other high school and college students how to build apps and eventually spiraled into what we're doing now. Great. Thank you all. As you can see, four amazing entrepreneurs. Um, again, came, started their companies um, at four very different schools at four different times. Um, but what I'd love to start with uh, for all of you is, is that, um, that entrepreneurial journey in terms of where did that come from? I work with so many entrepreneurs. And um, you know, when I was growing up and, and uh, in school, it seemed like the, the goal was to make as much money in the shortest period of time as possible and less about changing the world and making a difference. And now this generation, it's, it's so different. Can each of you talk a little bit about where your idea came from and where that sort of passion to control your own destiny, create, um, create something from nothing, where that came from? Was it a personal passion? Was it uh, just an idea that, that sparked from something? 
Anyone can start. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I, I think actually to, to the point that you made earlier, I think it's uh, entrepreneurship actually in many, for many people in Silicon Valley is the fastest way to make the most amount of money in the shortest period of time. <laughs> like, um, I don't necessarily think that all entrepreneurs are doing it for the right reasons or. Uh, it's also and, one of and, the hardest ways to make money, I think, too. Yeah, it's not like for yourself. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. And I, I think it kind of depends on what, what culture and what climate you grew up, grew up in. And I think for me, I, I was, uh, I went to high school and, and middle school in Palo Alto uh, area. Um, so around all these VCs and entrepreneurs, and most of my parents' friends were VCs and entrepreneurs, and so it's like, if you're good at math, you go into computer science. If you're good at computer science, you start a company, and that's the, that's the <laughs> expected path for you. And so um, for me, I think it, it was, uh, I haven't really broken out of the mold to do this. I, I just kind of followed, followed the quote unquote beaten path for someone coming out of my background. Yeah, John, I imagine it was quite different when you were starting your company in school. It was a little different, but um, I actually started the Prince Review as a means to start a software company. And I had a three-year rolling plan to sell it, and then just it kept rolling uh, <laughs> uh, through IPO. And um, but I, I think of entrepreneurship a little bit differently. Uh, I, I think it is a longer path to make a lot of money. Um, but it, if your mindset is solving problems, if you look around every day and you just see, boy, you know, I can't believe they do it this way. Uh, you know, why is there such a long line for this? Or, or you, you know, we're in school, why is it so hard to, to handle like who goes into what dorm room? Um, it's only logical to say, well, could I solve that? And once you start thinking that way, uh, I think starting your own business is almost inevitable. Yeah, yeah, and Darshan, you also started um, your company in the education space as well, so yeah. a personal problem to solve. <laughs> sure. Um, so. Um, my parents, actually your parents might be similar, given that I just met your dad earlier uh, in the <laughs> session, but they uh, so were always sort of pushing me to do different things. And when I was in eighth grade, they sent me to a nerd camp, um, and that's where I learned <laughs> HTML. And honestly, that just transformed like, my view of what one could do. I think when kids find ways of expressing themselves, I was never a good drawer, definitely not good at uh, fashion or design or things like that, but with HTML, you can actually create stuff um, on the web. and so. Uh, when my friend and I talked about making a tool to help students with their citations, we just saw it as a challenge. Like, this is a project. Could we actually do this? Um, and then I think for years later, we kept thinking about it as a project. So we didn't go into it uh, like it's going to be a company or a business. Uh, eventually, we realized it could be, and that was exciting. Um, my parents were definitely telling me to stay in school, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was forced to do that. But uh, in any case, uh, yeah, so for, for us, for me at least, that didn't come from the idea of wanting to become an entrepreneur or business person or have a business, yeah. something that I, I enjoy doing. Yeah. Same, yeah, same for me. My experience is like so different from all three of theirs. My, my journey to entrepreneurship kind of started um, way more emotional. It kind of stemmed from just a bad breakup during school and just that depression and heartbreak. And I you know, kind of decided to channel that, that negative energy into something creative. Like, I was never an artist. I never really cared much about fashion or pop culture or entertainment. But through that process, trying to find a creative outlet that just made me feel happy or better through that depression um, led me to, to drawing shoes. And I had never drawn anything in my life. So it was like so weird for everyone in my family. They were like, we didn't know you could draw. And I'm like, I didn't know either. Like, I taught myself how to do this because it was therapeutic, mm. you know? Um, so mine was very much like a passion project turned legitimate business uh, because money started coming in. <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering at what point did the light bulb go off that this project or this therapy for you could turn into a business? Right, so it was definitely when I realized that I had ideas mm -hmm. when it came to design. I realized I had my own aesthetic. I realized I was designing things that I couldn't find at Neiman Marcus or Barney's or Nordstrom. Um, and you know, that has value. Um, yeah. when, when you're designing you know, from the heart, like, you're really able to, to appeal to individual emotions and or like, you know, individual personality traits. Like, this is a shoe for a woman who's going to this meeting in this boardroom. It's going to be male dominated and she wants to look powerful. Like you design for specific kind of mm -hmm. occasions. 
I'd love to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges when you're trying to start a company when in school, um, establishing credibility. Um, uh, how do you do that? Um, I know, um, Ashu, you ended up dropping out of school, so um, maybe <laughs> being in school wasn't the right uh, place to be, but um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges or maybe failures along the way that um, uh, you guys experienced. Yeah, I'll uh, go out on a limb here and say that uh, college is like the worst place to start a company. Um, <laughs> and there's a few structural reasons for this, I think. Uh, so for my personal experience, I had like discovered this really exciting like way of building apps, and I was really passionate about it, and I really wanted to create more. Um, and I went to, uh, or I was working on this mostly in my dorm room, and I went to a professor of EE. I was trying to build uh, har hardware accessories for the iPhone. I went to a professor of EE at UCLA, and I'm like, hey, uh, can you teach me how to like connect this device to my iPhone via Bluetooth? And he's like, no, I don't know anything about that. Um, is, is there any professor here who knows about how to like, use modern devices and connect them via a new technology? Nope, we don't know anything about that. And I'm like, OK, can I at least work in your lab so that I have a place, I have a community of people, maybe there's some grad students I can ask questions to? Um, and he's like, you can, um, but I would recommend you don't, because if so, UCLA will try to take ownership over everything you create. And I basically felt so demoralized with that experience that I, I didn't feel supported by the community and the ecosystem. And I know things are a little bit different today where, where there are things like the iLab and so on and support that are trying to support it. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, uh, if you are a student um, and if you're an entrepreneur, like you're always worried about burn rate, burn rate, burn rate, burn rate. And so you're not only uh, not making money when you're first an entrepreneur, you're now paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to stay in this ecosystem that's not really designed, and maybe they had some small part of their organization over there that's helping you, um, but largely it's not the core of what you're doing and what you're paying for. Um, and so as a result, it's, it's people like me whose parents were paying for my college that can take the time to like not go to class ever and focus on my startup. Um, but if you don't have that luxury and you, you really have to work a second job to pay for school or you're really hustling to like get that job to be able to pay off your debt, um, it's, it's really not a, a good place for you to be. Yeah, and Darshan, you actually didn't do your startup full time coming out of school. Uh, you took a, a real job <laughs> for a short period of time. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so uh, after college, EasyBib uh, had grown to the point where we actually could start uh, working on it ourselves. And um, our goal, my, my co-founder and I, we never want to take on external capital. So we want to bootstrap the business all the way through. And we had the opportunity to do it. Um, this is another moment. And I think this was the right thing. Uh, but uh, my parents were like, look, we, get, we don't know what a bibliography is, um, which is probably one of the problems in, in a, as I was pitching it. Uh, but they wanted me to get like a full-time job. Uh, in retrospect, I thought that was actually a great idea. Um, I met a lot more people. I met the co-founder of, of Dropy, which is the, the other business that I founded. Um, and I think and that network has helped me further. So I don't know if, if, I, if the decisions that I wanted to do, I was, if I was able to do them, I don't even know if that would have been right. So I'm kind of glad to have had that support. With that said, back to your question about schooling um, or within or at Brown, I remember trying to construct a major that uh, brought in some RISD classes around design, some CS classes together, and I pitched it as a, a major that you could uh, pursue. And then I remember my advisor saying, you know what, this is too practical. <laughs> and so they basically refused to let me pursue it, which I thought was funny. Yeah, and you started off as a finance major, I believe, or an economics major. I um, majored in international relations. Okay, and did you begin to design your major around um, what you were trying to do as you were starting your company? Well, yes, because I started taking some art classes. Um, I started taking more international classes as I began to travel international more. As I said before, I make shoes in Italy, so I was, you know, my senior year, I was pretty much back and forth. Um, so I was just, you know, taking some more cultural classes um, just because it fit into my life at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so switching gears a little bit to thinking a little bit more, you know, Ashley, you touched on how unsupportive the university was. Um, what, what do you think universities uh, can do to support folks like you who are looking to do this and are going to do it anyway, might have to drop out if they're not getting the support? Um, and you know, the more provocative question is always, you know, can entrepreneurship be taught? Is this something that you can learn in school or do you have to do it outside of school? 
Yeah, I do think that you have to learn by doing. And so whatever mechanism that exists in school, it has to be a very active uh, way to learn. Uh, we went through Y Combinator, which is a startup incubator, um, which generally for entrepreneurship is, is seen as a better program to go through than Harvard Business School. Um, and it's because it's an inline program where you're starting your company, and then every week you're now getting advice to then go apply it and, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know that there is a ton that current universities can do to support entrepreneurship. And I'm not necessarily sure that they should. And I think one of the challenges with our university system in general is that they're trying to do a bit of everything when that's not necessarily the thing that they're, they're best at. And there is one thing that universities are excellent at, which is doing research. And they're these amazing innovation engines, not at the kind of last step of entrepreneurship, but in the first step of let's like figure out what is going on with the world, let's figure out all these technologies. Like any entrepreneur is using decades of Re, uh, university research to build whatever they're doing. Um, and I think that's an incredibly powerful thing. But I think that there's also room now for a new type of university. And some of the language that we used when we talk about make school as a, as a new institution is this idea of a product university instead of a research university. So it's then taking all this deep research that we have, but instead taking the people who are most excited to pick these different pieces up and put them together to create innovation, and then really structuring the entire education from the basis and having instructors who have experience with this working at startups or building products, um, and have in the entire ecosystem of that u university focused around the kind of either founders or early employees or sort of yeah. developers or creators at these different businesses. Um, and I think this should stand in contrast to um, and in, in mm. uh, support of the research university system. And John, you come from Princeton, one of the best uh, research universities in the world. Um, can, how do, if you could design Princeton today to support what you were doing and support entrepreneurs, what, would you, uh, what advice would you give the university? So there are a couple things if, if you think about setting the table. One is the expected lifespan and productive lifespan of you guys. You know, it's now getting towards 100 years. And um, there's no great rush to, uh, to skip the stuff that a research university can give you in terms of critical reasoning, in terms of, of, of an understanding of, of context of historical and and social context to, to whatever you're doing. And, and I wouldn't have universities do less of that to focus here. What they also bring, though, is a community. And, and that sense of uh, a couple schools are doing this in a really fledgling, crappy way. But I, I think there's a real opportunity here for an entrepreneur to say, um, whether it's a small percent of the endowment going to a venture fund that supports students and recent alums doing startups, uh, or just convening the community to separately fund, um, the ability for a university to convene its community around uh, that support is, I think, really important. And it could be um, uh, courses that are tight from a Y Combinator uh, and making that kind of information available to your students uh, as Princeton and other places have done, but it could also mean capital. Yeah, you know, and I think you brought up a really good point around community. I mean, here you are in this environment with incredibly diverse group of students from all over the world with different backgrounds, experiences, all coming together that in this like-minded way. Um, so the opportunity to share ideas and learn from each other in this community um, you know, and I'm curious from all of you, you know, as we think about um, how universities should design it, should it be co-curricular? Should it sit alongside the academic curriculum um, and allow you, you know, so many of my students talk about it as, as they're like, in, instead of the sport, <laughs> that the, the entrepreneurial community is, um, you know, how they find their people. Um, or should it be in the classroom or both? Is there, is there room for it um, in both places? Um, I can I can start with that one. Um, so I think um, I think I'll answer actually a different question, which is uh, when we think about what a university should do for entrepreneurs, we do think about in terms of programs and things we can add on incrementally to the overall curriculum. Um, I agree with John that universities provide a, a venue for building critical thinking skills. Um, fundamentally, I think what universities should do is try to lower the cost of their education. It's crazy that it costs $75,000 a year to go to a private school. Um, and I think when you think about how people make their decisions, cost is a big part of that. 
and then you make these choices, should I do A or B? It's not A and B. Um, and I think if universities figured out how to reduce their tuition, it's not because they pay a bunch of faculty a lot of money. Tuition rises because administrators are getting paid more and real estate costs are increasing. If they can fundamentally alter those things, we can have cheaper schools that provide the same quality of education and maybe it's not an either or. Yeah, I agree, I don't think it has to be an either or. I think you can teach the critical thinking skills mm. through a different lens. Um, but, I, but I do feel that, uh, I, I don't agree that our generation has more time. Um, you have to start a family if you want to start a family by 35. Um, in order to buy a house, you have to earn a lot of money. If you have student debt, you're now being pushed out. Housing prices have skyrocketed in the last two decades. Um, our generation, the, the youth today, they're not drinking, they're not having sex, they're not partying. They're showing up to work hard and fighting because they know that every dollar is necessary if they want to live in the cities with economic opportunity. And so they're like, it's a very different problem that set that they're facing that, yeah, they have a 100-year career, but um, it's most, the, like the first bit of it is going to be a grind just to capture what was granted and what was given um, to, to early generations. And I think they're, they're, the, the, the time and the cost is actually a very relevant question. Mm -hmm. And when we think about it, is we can think about kind of flipping this model on its head, especially for people who come from low-income backgrounds. Let's go through a more focused program around what they want to do. We'll teach some of the critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. but then we'll also give them resources that when they're working adults, they can continue to learn more and develop more of the critical thinking. Instead of saying you're learning everything in four years and then you're going to the workforce, you'll, for us, we'll try to teach you as much as we can in two years, get you earned make sure that you have a stable job and livelihood. And then San Francisco is amazing. There's amazing uh, speakers that are coming from everywhere, uh, from all the, the top research universities are coming to San Francisco to give lectures and give talks. You can get that quality of education in any city, in any modern city, you can get a university quality education just by poking your head up mm -hmm. and listening to figure, figuring out what's going on. And Kendall, you ended up after, I don't, I don't know if you did it during or after um, your traditional four-year degree, you went to a very special um, fashion school in Milan. Yeah. I, and how did that give you the specific skills that you were looking for? Exactly. So USC kind of taught me like the very broad skills that I needed to just to just be a professional in general. You know, mm -hmm. time management skills. You know how to send a professional email to my professors and you know, negotiate grades and you know, kind of just those kind of day-to-day -day skills that I use on a daily basis that have huge impact. Um, and I did, I went to Ars Tutoria, which is you know, the leading kind of accessories um, university, one, one of the leading in the world. Uh, it's in Milan, Italy, and I kind of just went there for my more technical training on footwear. Um, and kind of just more human anatomy, like about you know the foot and how heels change your posture, your gait, all of those sorts of technical things. Um, but you know my my time at USC, I can't lie to you, it was very miserable, um, and I thought the curriculum was very um, just weird, hard for no reason. The professors were very kind of judgmental, and I was I was a student with disabilities. Um, so that kind of made my, my time there a little bit harder. Um, I had com accommodations that I needed. Um, so it was just the overall culture. I, think, I don't think entrepreneurship can be taught. I think it's, it's, like, it's like a LeBron James. Like you, you, you can't teach that kind of leadership. Like he's playing this position, but he knows what that person's doing and that person's doing and that person's doing. Like you can't teach those types of super conscious skills. Um, so I don't, I took an entrepreneur class at USC, it was very strange. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if, if I based my, you know, willingness to go forward with it off that class, it would have been a hard no. Um, um, but the skills that you learn at school really set you up to, to be either like a great founder um, or, you know, yeah. a, like a more I lazy always, um, liken it to uh, music appreciation. You know, you can take a music appreciation class and you have an appreciation for music and you may understand theories of music and instruments, but it could I actually that play that instrument? Exactly. No. It doesn't and give I, you that <laughs> rhythm, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, at the iLab, we try to bring in uh, practitioners who are actually doing it and they're not teaching them... Um, 
uh, the theories of entrepreneurship, but it's more the how-tos. How do I get something done? And I think, you know, as all of you are talking, those real practical skills are, are what you were looking for. Yeah. Um, but you learn those on the job quickly. Yes, yes, yes. Quickly. Um, so that brings up the question around, you know, is it, you know, should the university um, ecosystem be the best place that you start a company. Um, you know, what I find is so many of our entrepreneurs, instead of dropping out, are trying not to graduate because they enjoy the resources that we offer. Um, and every school, you know, offers different things. Um, but as we start to switch gears and think about the future of entrepreneurship in higher ed, um, what what should it look like? You know, we talk about the practical skills. Um, how can higher ed keep up so that it, it is relevant and it's not weird? <laughs> it has to, I think it has to stem more from community. Like, I think when I was in school and I wanted to start my business and I had to tell my professors, like, look, I'm super invested in this class and I need to graduate, because I had to, my parents were like, you have to. Um, but I have to be in Italy for this week and that week, can I make up that test or can I take it early? Um, and it was just always met with so much resistance. Um, it, it kind of put me in that like crabs in a barrel. It's like, we, we, the competition, like the way that they just, the way my professors kind of pitted me against everyone else. Like, mm. okay, you can do that, but you know, these students are gonna, these students are gonna probably pass you up and I can only give five A's in this class and you know, you're not gonna be one of them. And it's just mm. like, you know, it's like you try so hard, but that, that cultural piece yeah, is yeah. really, really missing. And, and I think that's what really discourages so many founders from starting their businesses in college. You know, that's a really good point, that culture of innovation, of no consequences for failure and collaboration rather than competition, exactly. which is not necessarily the way higher ed is constructed with grades. Exactly. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have any thoughts around that as well. I I had a 2.4 GPA, <laughs> yeah, me too. so I solved that a different way. I, mean, I think this is a great point. Like all our classes are pass fail um, because it reduces competition yeah. with students. They work much harder than I think a lot of students at, at universities uh, or other other institutions. Um, and I think really it's just getting out of students' way. Is that students are super passionate about learning. The way that our education system from K through higher ed is designed is assuming that students don't want to work. And so we should provide a lot of like boundaries and barriers and structures <coughs> to like create incentives for them to work harder and learn more. Um, and I think that's really the wrong way to think about it. I think the best way to think about it is like all these students want to create, right? It's exactly like Darshan said. It's when you discover this this way to express yourself through HTML or through drawing shoes or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, it yeah, exactly. Your passion. It's, you just get so fired up and you want to work so hard. Yeah. And so that's the thing that you should foster. Like people learn things at a, like, I would say probably like a 5x higher rate if they care about what they're learning and if they're really excited about it. And if they don't, then it's just in one ear out the other. And so how do we design the, the entire education that is things that students really deeply care about and then yeah. just get out of the way, let them run, yeah. be guides on the side and, and like yeah. let them opt out of structure. So the other thing we do is if there's a student who's performing really, really well and they want to be uh, working on some project that's not co covered in our coursework, whatever it is, we let that student opt out. That's not true of the students who are not progressing through the coursework. We try to provide a little bit more structure, but you basically have this earned agency where you can then graduate to a point where like you, you can kind of do whatever, whatever, whatever you want to focus on um, with your time, whether, whether that's going to class or, or working on your company. What what is the age of your students? Uh, they're all college age, so uh, 18 to 22 is the bulk of them. And, and they're doing few, this instead of uh, traditional college? Um, they're, they're getting their bachelor's degree from, from us, so um, yeah, built sort of a new new form of university. <laughs> and they're there for four years? Uh, two, two years, but plus summers, and they're working uh, 50, 60 hours a week while they're there. You know, and I think one of the things that, you know, I you hear a lot at conferences like this is, the pace of change is faster than ever, and we don't know what the jobs of the future look like. And you know, 50% of skills that we acquire are gonna be obsolete in five years, and all those crazy statistics that are out there. 
and you know, how can we best prepare students for the future that is so uncertain? Um, so uh, anyone have any provocative thoughts on you know, the, how to disrupt or continue to evolve um, the educational system so that it can be relevant 20 years from now and, and students can still find um, their place in the educational system? Well, first of all, what's common to all of us is we took some tech uh, courses, but we took what we focused on design as well. Uh, I ended up majoring in architecture. Hmm. Um, the the um, underlying skills to be an entrepreneur aren't stuff you learn in business school as much as 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 you learn in design and in and in the use of tech. But second, um, you know, it's it's pretty clear to anybody thoughtful that the best education for uh, complicated times that you've described is gonna be a liberal arts education. It's gonna be uh, a broad set of, of thinking skills that make you agile as new opportunities or, or, or challenges come up. And the people who are really terrible at talking about that, of course, are liberal arts educators um, <laughs> who somehow can't get the message out that what they're doing is actually relevant. and. Uh, yeah. And that's problematic. I actually think a liberal arts education is more relevant than ever in these complicated times with automation and technology. And if we don't understand the policy and ethics and all of the liberal arts skills, um, we're going to be in big trouble. So I actually think it's more relevant than ever. And I know, Darshan, you, you were a public policy major. I and... Was a public policy major. <laughs> and, and I totally agree. I think having uh, those skills or taking classes that help you think more broadly about society and your impact are really valuable. Um, I think reducing the cost so more people can get that kind of education is better. I also read an article earlier this week that I think was, was whizzing around uh, the conference about how in many of the Ivy League schools, there are more people from the 1% represented there than people from the bottom 60%. Uh, and I think if you have schools that are these sort of ivory towers, these bubbles that are away from reality, uh, and then uh, you don't offer opportunities for more people to be in those schools, I think that's probably limiting from the standpoint of entrepreneurship because oftentimes you get great ideas through diversity and through you know, these sort of collisions that happen in society that you might not experience in schools if they you know, don't sort of reform how they're bringing in students. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we, we like to talk about it as, as structured serendipity, bringing students together and allowing those collisions to occur in, in an organic way. And I think the university setting is such a wonderful opportunity to bring students together from all sorts of backgrounds um, from around the globe, and we need to continue to do that. Um. Yeah, but another thing that I think is um, kind of just the university setting also teaches you so much about what you don't want, <laughs> like out of life, and it like it really kind of you really kind of hit this wall, like as an entrepreneur, and you're like okay, this is what my professors have been shoving down my throat for four years. I don't agree with that. Like, I have to unlearn that. Hmm. And it was like, when I, when I made the conscious like, realization that I had to unlearn some things hmm. that have been shoved down my throat, like, even since probably preschool, like, it changed my entire outlook on life. And what was that unlearning that... It was that there can only be one person who's the top of the class. Like, mm. I mean, there can technically really only be one person who has the highest grade <laughs> in the class, but it's like, that doesn't mean that everyone else is like failing. Like, we could all succeed together. Like, it's no right. longer that culture of like, the professor is like speaking down on me, like everyone who's older, because I'm, I'm a 25 year old CEO, like I'm meeting with people that are like 50, 60 years old. And it's like, I have to unlearn that, like when I'm speaking to an elder, they're talking down on mm. me, like so many of my professors that did. That you have credibility. Exactly, and exactly. It, it's really kind of just stepping into your own, because mm. I feel like I went to private school my whole life and, and it was just really coddling and it was just, not broad, it was not diverse. USC is not diverse. And the thinking within the university is just not diverse. And once you realize that that's not how the real world is represented, mm -hmm. you realize you have to unlearn so many things. Mm -hmm. And having that tool of being able to unlearn something that's even normal, a societal norm, is very powerful. Mm -hmm. There's a thread across uh, what a lot of folks here have said around, uh, and, and kind of tying back to your original question, is like, how do you get students to, 
to learn what they need for a 100 year career. Yeah. Um, but it, it's character development. And it's not really taught very well um, yeah. in, in a lot of universities. And it, it's, about, uh, it's about how to be a collaborative teammate and how to be supporting your peer students and not have this competitive structure. It's about uh, understanding racial and gender dynamics in, in your institution. Um, it's about understanding how to uh, learn how to learn and focus on, on yourself um, and iterate on your engine and know that you don't just stop learning liberal arts when you're in college, but you should yeah. also continue to learn liberal yeah. arts for, for, for the rest of your life. And I think um, there's a lot around, uh, so when we think about the cornerstones of education, it's like there, there needs to be a component around liberal arts. There needs to be a component around character development, which we think is underserved, um, mm -hmm. and, and learning skills like empathy. And, um, yeah. and then there needs to be a component around practical today skills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be an either or. I think this is one of the challenges with the university system to say, you can either be this or you can either be this right. and they and can like, sit alongside and coexist they, exactly. i mean we as humans as adults right it, it coexists within us yeah exactly. and so, so why shouldn't you learn that right yeah. right right and, and, and universities those, don't serve that and those soft skills those you know traditionally yeah. soft skills really they can be taught and they yeah. can be practiced okay so i'm looking at the time we have about four minutes left i want to make sure that we save a couple questions from the audience if anyone has any um They've told me to, for you guys to use a mic so that uh, we can all hear you and it can get recorded. Can you guys do that? All right, he's coming around with the mic <laughs> up here to the front. Um, Lori Kinnear, I teach fifth grade actually, and my, my interest is actually the homeroom part. Like, what do you think elementary wise? Because we're trying all this stuff, trust me. <laughs> but you know, with the with the little kids, so they're not here at the next panel saying, "Really, it's not working for yeah. me." Before they have to unlearn. Things, yeah, right? exactly. Let's teach them the I right things. I want to help things. them now. Yeah, <laughs> and we have the liberal arts education, so we've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts from the panel? One of one of my favorite thought experiments was uh, they plunked down in. Uh, I think it was. Uh, Rural India could have been, it could have been uh, another country. Um, computers uh, behind glass with a keyboard and people, kids, would go up, figure out the computers and teach themselves uh, English and, and teach themselves how to use the web and, and look around the world. And to the degree that uh, unstructured time can be spent just just supplying digital uh, uh, tools, uh, uh, 3D printers, and see what the kids come up with. I think it's, it's probably more than a curricular answer. Mm -hmm. And I just love the idea of experiential learning before we beat it out of them, the ability to practice and play and, and learn by doing, and you know, all the things that the panelists talk about in terms of collaboration and uh, empathy and how to work with each other. Um, that's just so incredibly important, and uh, the earlier we can teach that, I think the better off we'll all be. I would, yeah. I would take a look at a school called Nueva School. Um, if you can visit there, it's in uh, Hillsborough. I went there for yeah. middle school. There's no homework, no grades, no tests. Your evaluations are all like well written. Um, it's very project based. You're constantly building things. They have a booth at the Maker Fair every year, so they're like fifth graders are like presenting projects that they develop. Um, it's a very amazing environment. Unfortunately, only available to a small number of people who can right. afford to pay that much in this one area of. Uh, I'm sure there are other schools like that as well. Um, but I think there are models that are doing it well. I don't think any of the kind of innovations in education and how to do it right are new. I think it's most of this stuff has been researched 30 years ago in the exact same institutions that are not applying it right now. Um, and so it's just a matter of how, how do you actually implement them in, in your institution. Mm. I also got a lot of, um, uh, I guess, influence from seeing role models. So our school would bring in uh, various entrepreneurs and we'd listen to them. And when you're a kid, you're very impressionable. And so hearing that, hearing that there's opportunity that people can actually do this, I'm always like, uh, I think, open up my eyes more so to the different kinds of opportunities that there are out there. Totally. And role models that look like your students. Mentorship. So, yeah. Yeah, women, people of color, et cetera. Uh, maybe one more question, we'll wrap it up. Where's the mic? Oh, you wanna, since you have the mic, you wanna ask your question and pass it on? Sure, so I was in college. I started a clothing company with a partner. It was his passion to do it. I just stumbled into it. I wasn't super into it, and so I moved away from that. He, he did it for a 30-year career. I joined the Air Force and was a pilot because that's what I always wanted to do. And I don't think that there's a formula for entrepreneurship, and each one of you, for the most part, kind of followed your heart, not because the college 
teach, taught you to do that, it provided a, a framework, but it seems to me that if there was a way for the, the school environment or just the, the environment, academic or not, to let you follow that path, that's the key to success more than taking the entrepreneurial class that um, kind of gives you the formula, but not really the passion. You guys have any thoughts on how to turn that spark on? Because that's what's going to get the student on the right path, not the formula or the, the, the class. Yeah, I, I think um, this point is actually one of the reasons why we think it's so important to teach employable skills to every single person who's in school. Because if you have the, the luxury of following your passion as in your parents are paying for college and you have a safety net like I did, then it's very easy to do that. But for most students in America, that's not the case. And so what you do when you give people employable skills and you ensure that they can make a living, you then give them opportunity to simultaneously to developing those skills that they know they're gonna have a job in, to then discover their passions, whether that's in school or then later after, after being in school. And so often having those employable skills is actually liberating for a lot of students if you have a rhetoric which, which is saying, hey, learn these employable skills now so you have a safety net, and then do whatever, follow your passion on top of that. Again, it doesn't need to be an either or thing. One difference between what you guys are saying though, um, what you hear at conferences like this um, are a lot of people who feel that they know what every kid should learn. And, and that's just insane, right? The, the, you're, you're totally right. There are people who should go to a school like yours. There are people who should learn entrepreneurship. There are people who should fly. And, uh, and the more that we can help people find their path, A, what school should you be at to learn it, and then B, within the school, you know, as you, as you navigate, uh, uh, the better. And that's really hard and it's probably expensive, uh, but it's really critically important. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the interest in following your passion is so um, equated to entrepreneurship. It's controlling your own destiny and allowing you to pursue your passion. If we can marry that with the right skills in a university setting, I think everyone will be better off. They're telling me the time is up, and I so appreciate you all for being here, and thank you so much to my panelists.